Hello friends, this is Vision Overseas. We are providing both online and offline coaching with most repeated and authentic practice material. Once you join our coaching, you will be updated with latest practice material for next quarter. If you have any question or query, you can visit our website thevisionoverseas.com and even you can contact us on given WhatsApp number for more details. Thank you. For some people, this proposition may seem far-fetched, but ending poverty is both morally necessary and actually feasible. All of us must play a role in making it happen. All human beings want and have a right to live in dignity, to determine our own destinies, and to be respected by other, by other people. Despite the universality of these rights, our capacities to fulfill them vary enormously. And no dividing line is more profound in influencing the quality of our lives than the gulf between poverty and, pros and prosperity. Well, there, there, there's a positive obligation on the bank to ensure that the people who are signing a loan guarantee know what they're doing. Loan guarantees are, are kind of unique in, the, in that someone is giving security or a guarantee and placing themselves at risk for someone else, and they receive nothing material in return. So you've got to ask yourself, why is this person doing this? Do they know what they're doing? They're risking a lot and, and not really getting anything back for it. So the imperative is that the bank must ensure that these people know what they're doing and that they fully understand the implications of what they're doing and they know that, that their properties may be sold if another person doesn't meet their obligations. Well, there are many factors that can cause one species to divide into two. One of these is when populations get isolated from each other by something like a lake forming or forest being cleared. And there's another idea that as individuals adapt to their environment, this might have a knock-on effect on mate choice, a process called sensory drive speciation. Now this seems to occur in cyclid fish. They have shown that a female preference for either red or blue striped males only exists in clear water, where they are actually able to see. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Cynthia Graber. This will just take a minute. Sex might seem like one of those little gifts from evolution, but it's pretty inefficient from an evolutionary perspective. It'd be much easier to reproduce if you could do away with finding the right member of the opposite sex to help you create the next generation. So why did evolution come up with sex? Biologists have hypothesized that one driving force might have been parasites. Now scientists have had a chance to test that theory. Asexual reproduction leads to clones. Being genetically identical, clones are also weak in the same ways, and thus more likely to also come to a parasite. But sex keeps shuffling the genetic deck. Well, there's a snail common in New Zealand lakes that does both. Some populations have sex, and some reproduce asexually. So researchers spent 10 years monitoring the two populations and the number of parasites living off both groups. As expected, cloned snails that were plentiful at the beginning of the study suffered big losses as they became infected with parasites, but the sexual snail populations remained stable, results published in the journal American Naturalist. So next time you're feeling sexy, thank a parasite. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Cynthia Graber. Expand your knowledge with the latest academic research at academicminute.org. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Amy Kraft. Got a minute? Here's one way bats might get their next meal. By eavesdropping on flies having sex. Bats eat a lot of seemingly undetectable flies. To find out how the winged mammals find the insects, researchers set up a video camera inside a cow shed that was home to a bat colony and lots of bugs. The video showed that bats rely on their echolocation skills to detect flies at a specific time, when they're engaged in rather noisy sex. 
Mm-hmm. Flies are usually quiet in bat territory and sit on cluttered ceilings in caves where background noise masks the echoes from their movement. But when flies are feeling frisky, males can't help but flutter their wings, emitting a burst of click sounds that the bats pick up on. During more than 1,000 sexual encounters caught in the act on video, 5% of the insects were caught in the act by bats. The research is published in the journal Current Biology. The study shows that ignorance can be safer than carnal knowledge when predators are on the prowl. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Amy Kraft. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? The 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics goes to Saul Perlmutter at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Brian Schmidt at the Australian National Lab, and Adam Rees at Johns Hopkins, the Royal Swedish Academy's Olga Botner. In a universe which is dominated by matter, one would expect gravity eventually should make the expansion slow down. Imagine then the utter astonishment when two groups of scientists headed by this year's Nobel laureate in 1998 discovered that the expansion was not slowing down, it was actually accelerating. By comparing the brightness of distant, faraway supernovae with the brightness of nearby supernovae, the scientists discovered that the faraway supernovae were about 25% too faint. They were too far away. The universe was accelerating. And so this discovery is fundamental and a milestone for cosmology and a challenge for generations of scientists to come. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? Here's an impassioned plea for gun control. Of nail guns, that is, because accidents involving nail guns have gone through the renovated roof. In 2005, almost 15,000 people were treated in U.S. emergency rooms for nail gun injuries. That's twice the number in 2001 and three times the injuries back in 1991, according to data released in the April 13th issue of Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report put out by the CDC. The rising popularity of do-it-yourselfing seems to be behind the unfortunate trend. Most injuries are punctuated wounds to the hands, followed by hits to the forearms, legs, and feet, 6% of the wounded wind up being hospitalized. Although better safety instruction would no doubt help, the report's authors suggest a systems approach to the problem. They'd like nail guns to be impossible to fire until the nose was depressed, which would presumably happen only when the gun was flush up against whatever needed nailing. By the way, 96% of the injured were males, which could mean that they're doing most of the work or that women read the instructions. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Got a minute? The pain-relieving effects of drugs like ibuprofen are well known. But ibuprofen and its relatives, known as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, may someday have another use, as antibiotics. Researchers tested three anti-inflammatory drugs, bromfenac, used in eye drops, and carprofen and vetoprofen, both for treating conditions like arthritis in dogs. The investigators found that all three drugs bind to something called the DNA clamp in bacteria. That clamp's essential to repairing and replicating DNA. By jamming it, the painkillers can actually kill live E. coli, in a test tube at least. The findings appear in the journal Chemistry and Biology. Study author Aaron Oakley of Australia's University of Wollongong says we still need clinical trials to tell if this trick holds true in humans. But this study is a first step. Yeah, I guess it alerts a lot of clinicians to the fact that some of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that they're using may have this off-target effect. And it gives drug developers, like Oakley and his colleagues, a whole new way to attack antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata.
This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. This will just take a minute. Breaking a mirror means seven years bad luck, and so does spilling salt or meeting a black cat. We've all heard such silly-sounding superstitions. Of course, why anybody would believe that stepping on a crack could break your mother's back is a mystery. But according to an article in the Royal Society journal Biological Sciences, superstitious behaviors are a natural product of evolution. Imagine an animal living in an environment where, over the course of a day, he might hear some rustling in the leaves or maybe in the grass. Now, movements in the grass could signal a predator attack, whereas the breeze in the trees is probably just the wind. Still, the animal has a choice. He can ignore all this rustling and go about his business, or he can run and hide. The most logical response would be to hide only when he hears the grass move. But what if it's hard to tell whether the noise came from the grass or the trees? Well, I could have sworn that was the trees. Could be his final thought. So the animal learns to bolt at the sound of the breeze because it could foretell certain doom. That better safe than sorry attitude is essentially a superstition, one that that cautious critter will likely pass on to his young. Knock on wood. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. This will just take a minute. Plan on breaking bread with friends and family this holiday season, but worried about the salt? Well, chemists may have come up with an enlightening solution. They've discovered that bread that's more airy tastes saltier. The finding is in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry. There's sodium chloride in everything we eat. It enhances flavor and improves the shelf life of foods. But too much salt can contribute to hypertension and baked goods top the list of offenders. So, can we cut back on sodium without saying no to dinner rolls? To find out, researchers hit the kitchen, and they whipped up some loaves with the same amount of salt, but with different textures. By adjusting how long they allowed the dough to rise, they made breads that were either fine-grained and dense, or more porous and light. And they found that volunteers rated the fluffier bread as tasting more briny. By collecting samples of their subject's spit, the researchers determined that bread with larger pores releases its sodium faster when it's chewed. It's that rush of sodium that makes salt a mouth-watering saline sensation, even if there's less of it. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. This'll just take a minute. Pregnant women shouldn't drink. It's become gospel because of the danger of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Alcohol can disturb the normal development of a fetus, leading to a lifetime of learning disabilities and social problems. But the percentage of children born with the disorder has remained constant despite the warnings. And not all fetuses of drinking mothers suffer. Now research with rats has shown why some fetuses are naturally protected, which could lead to ways to protect the vulnerable. Ones. The work is in the FASIB journal. The key is a gene called DIO3, which governs the levels of thyroid hormone in the brain. If mom passes on a normal DIO3, no problem. And a male fetus that inherits a problem DIO3 variation from mom, but a normal DIO3 from dad, should be okay. But alcohol can stop dad's normal DIO3 gene from working. Now mom's bad DIO3 allows the brain to be flooded with thyroid hormone damaging the hippocampus. The hope is that gene screening could ID women whose fetuses would be at risk and that dietary supplements or drugs could block alcohol's effect and keep a child from suffering from a parent's addiction. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. This will just take a minute. Yeast. They already participate in producing some of the most popular pain-killing substances around, beer and wine. Now, scientists have engineered yeast that can also make one of the most powerful analgesics, morphine. Their work is in the journal Nature Chemical Biology. Opiates like morphine and codeine are essential for treating severe pain. But making these meds isn't easy. All are derived from opium poppies and tens to hundreds of thousands of tons are needed to meet global needs. The crops can also be affected by climate, disease, and even political turmoil in the countries where the plants are grown, which further limits commercial production. To get around these potential challenges, researchers have turned to yeast, an organism that can be grown easily on industrial scales. The scientists inserted into yeast cells a handful of genes isolated from the opium poppy. These genes encode the enzymes the plants use to produce opiates. 
After tweaking the system to adjust the relative amounts of the enzymes, the researchers could feed their yeast a precursor chemical called thebane and get pure morphine in return. The yeast can't yet make opiates from scratch, but with a bit more effort and a few more enzymes, yeast may produce painkillers that are prescription strength. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Cynthia Graber. This will just take a minute. Some people like to think there's something faded about who we fall in love with. It's that perfect mix of attraction, compatibility, and of course, timing. But in some cases, fate may be taking its cues from birth control pills. First, let's go over a woman's cycle and how that affects attraction. When women are ovulating, their features change in ways that men unconsciously pick up. So men are particularly attracted to women when they're fertile. And it works the other way, too. When a woman is fertile, she's more attracted to men with more traditionally masculine features and who are genetically dissimilar to her or more compatible in terms of procreating. Of course, oral contraception changes a woman's hormonal cycles. Her body thinks it's pregnant and doesn't go through ovulation-induced changes. And in a study published this month in the journal Trends in Ecology and Evolution, researchers say that women on the pill do not show the ovulation-induced attraction to genetically dissimilar partners. So they might be choosing men who are more genetically similar, which could lead to some of the problems with conception that have become increasingly common. Because attraction isn't fate, it's chemistry. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Cynthia Graber. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Got a minute? When the first shots were fired at JFK's motorcade, police couldn't immediately locate the gunmen based on sound alone. Today, the technology exists for them to do it with their smartphones, less than a second after the first shot. Here's how. Most bullets travel at supersonic speeds, generating a shock wave along their path. To track that path, researchers built a small Bluetooth sensor for smartphones, The sensor uses four mics to measure the shockwave's angle and its time of arrival. Then each phone networks with nearby phones to triangulate the sniper's location, mapping it on the smartphone screen within a second of the gun blast. Researchers tested the system with an AK-47 and were able to calculate the shooter's bearings with less than 7 degrees of error and get a decent estimate of his range. They presented the method at the Conference on Information Processing in Sensor Networks in Philadelphia. Since the system requires at least two phones to work, researchers say it would be ideal for a security force fanned out around a likely target, allowing them to respond to threats almost as fast as a speeding bullet. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. The epidemic swept the world. Fortunately, it was only the World of Warcraft, a popular online role-playing game. But that got the attention of real disease experts at Tufts and Rutgers universities. That's because the accidental outbreak that attacked the virtual characters offered a unique opportunity to study how social groups can help spread a disease. In late 2005, the epidemic hit the World of Warcraft, played by millions. It all started with an error. One creature was supposed to infect only a few virtual players with so-called corrupted blood but some of the nastiest virtual inhabitants exploited a flaw and spread the disease to unsuspecting masses. The virtual quarantines game designers tried to impose didn't work, in part because the virtual people didn't follow them, and so entire virtual cities were virtually destroyed. The experts were fascinated because they've never had a way to realistically simulate how large groups of people will react to an epidemic, but the cure for a real epidemic still won't be as easy as the virtual one was. They just reprogrammed the computers. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Got a minute? It's no secret cigarettes can yellow your teeth, but tobacco smoke has another unseen effect. It can wipe out the healthy bacteria in your mouth, leaving the field open for pathogenic bugs, like the kind that cause gum disease. So says a study in the journal Infection and Immunity. 
Researchers gave a complete dental cleaning to 30 volunteers, half of whom were regular smokers. Then, as bacteria moved back in, they took plaque samples and sequenced the DNA in those scrapings. And they found that non-smokers tended to have stable bacterial communities, dominated by a few benign species. That's good, because a healthy biofilm educates your immune system, preventing unnecessary attacks and inflammation, and it keeps bad bacteria at bay. Smokers, on the other hand, had wildly transient populations, with species moving in and out, which opened up real estate for the bad bugs. Smokers also had higher levels of inflammation, which can destroy friendly bacteria too. The researchers aren't sure yet why smoking has this effect, but if you're looking for a new reason to quit, how about avoiding your dentist? Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Got a minute? During the 2008 presidential election, the internet became a giant rumor mill. For example, there were the viral emails claiming Barack Obama's birth certificate was a fake, or one spreading the phony Sarah Palin quote, God made dinosaurs 4,000 years ago. Some political scholars worry the web could undermine democracy by misinforming and polarizing voters. But websites and blogs don't serve up the most influential rumors. Our inboxes do. So says a study of email in the journal Human Communication Research. Just after the election, researcher R. Kelly Garrett randomly surveyed 600 Americans about their online habits and whether they'd heard and believed a number of widespread rumors. He found that the web does expose us to more rumors, but the web also delivers more rebuttals, which can even the field. Email is more insidious because you're more likely to believe that rumor forwarded by Cousin Rob. And the more you believe something, Garrett says, the more you want to share it with your social network, spawning a nasty cascade of misperception. So before you hit send to forward email, ask yourself, do I know the item I'm sharing is true or do I just want it to be? Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? The World Series starts October 22nd with the improbable American League champion Tampa Bay Rays hosting the National League best Philadelphia Phillies. And there's a 59% chance that the Rays will take the title. That's what Bruce Bouquet says, anyway. He's a mathematician at the New Jersey Institute of Technology who sets odds on the playoffs and World Series every year. Bouquet starts with each player's statistics for the 2008 season. He then uses a model that estimates run production per game based on those stats. His most probable outcomes are a 20% chance of a Rays championship in six games and a 19% chance of a seven-game Rays win. But beware, in the 2006 postseason, only one of his favorites in the seven different series actually came out victorious. Nevertheless, he's gotten it right in six of the last eight years. Of course, when predicting sporting events, always followed the advice of Damon Runyon, who said, The race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but that's the way to bet. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Sophie Bushwick. Got a minute? Some dinosaurs were really huge, and now we may have a better way to estimate just how heavy these giants were. Researchers have developed a method to weigh dinosaurs based on laser scans of their skeletons. The studies in the journal Biology Letters. Looking at a bare human skeleton, how would you guess whether its owner was chubby or svelte? If you calculated how much space the fully fleshed body occupied, you could multiply that volume by tissue density to find the weight. Researchers laser scanned 14 modern mammal skeletons to create digital models of each body. These 
3D models were unrealistically scrawny, with skin stretched tight over the bones, but their undersized volumes were consistent, measuring in as 21% less than the actual animals. Based on this information, the researchers scanned giraffe titan bones, added 21% to the digital model's volume, and then calculated the dinosaur's weight, about 51,000 pounds. The technique could become the preferred way to estimate mass based on skeletons, improving our understanding of how extinct species lived and moved, and helping paleontologists make earth-shaking discoveries. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Sophie Bushwick. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? Wee! That's the sound a snail makes when it's riding on the back of a turtle. When they're not riding turtles, though, snails produce a little mucus trail as they creep along the ground. Well, according to research just published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Biological Sciences, snails also ride along on wee pre-existing mucus trails left by other snails. It's like a snail superhighway. Okay, a snail highway. Okay, a snail way. The research involved marine snails, but probably applies to all snails, which may expend a third of all their energy producing mucus. So an obvious benefit is that individual snails can save energy that would otherwise go into cutting fresh trails. Snail experts had thought this was the case, but the new study proves it, and it wasn't easy. The researchers actually measured the thickness of snail trails. A new trail could accommodate a second traveler without additional mucus, but weathered trails got thicker as snails added a bit of mucus where necessary. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. The early Earth's oceans were home to a lot of interesting chemistry. Now scientists have found that amino acids thought to be present way back when could have been cooked into other compounds vital for life, an idea you should take with a grain of salt. Four billion years ago, the planet was probably covered by a salty ocean dotted with volcanic islands and short-lived continents. German researchers recently mimicked some of the chemistry taking place along the coasts of the volcanic islands. They created an approximation of primordial seawater, then they evaporated it to simulate what went on at those volcanic coasts. They baked the residue, creating salt crusts. At those high temperatures, amino acids interacted with metal ions in the salt crusts and were converted into other important biological molecules such as pyrroles, which are part of the structures of chlorophyll in plants and hemoglobin in animals. The scientists presented their findings September 17th at the European Planetary Science Conference in Potsdam. Over hundreds of thousands of years, these novel compounds could have built up along the volcanic coasts, creating materials for the first living cells, which were really worth their salt. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? Here's an impassioned plea for gun control. Of nail guns, that is, because accidents involving nail guns have gone through the renovated roof. In 2005, almost 15,000 people were treated in U.S. emergency rooms for nail gun injuries. That's twice the number in 2001 and three times the injuries back in 1991, according to data released in the April 13th issue of Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, put out by the CDC. The rising popularity of do-it-yourselfing seems to be behind the unfortunate trend. Most injuries are puncture wounds to the hands, followed by hits to the forearms, legs, and feet. Six percent of the wounded wind up being hospitalized. Although better safety instruction would no doubt help, the report's authors suggest a systems approach to the problem. They'd like nail guns to be impossible to fire until the nose was depressed, which would presumably happen only when the gun was flush up against whatever needed nailing. By the way, 96 percent of the injured were males, which could mean that they're doing most of the work or that women read the instructions. One of the concerns about working with genetically modified crops has been that vegetation growing in agricultural fields might escape out into the world. Now, for the first time in the U.S., researchers report a large population of GM crops beyond the farm. 
Transgenic canola plants in North Dakota had received genes making them resistant to herbicides, such as the weed killer Roundup. Researchers collected and tested 406 canola plants along thousands of miles of state roads. They found 347 carrying at least one resistance gene. There were also indications that the inserted genes were being passed on to new generations, producing some plants in the wild with multiple transgenes. The findings were presented on August 6 at the annual meeting of the Ecological Society of America in Pittsburgh. The transgenic canola plants are not about to take over the world, but researchers are obviously curious about how these particular plants manage to make it in places like the edges of parking lots rather than pampered fields. Any answers they find will likely affect future biotechnology regulation. Eastern gray tree frog looks exactly like the closely related Cope's gray tree frog. The big difference between the two species is beneath the surface. The eastern has twice the number of chromosomes, as does the Cope's. Having more sets of chromosomes makes the cells of the eastern frog larger than the cells found in the Cope's, and those bigger cells makes the eastern's song just a little deeper. Now University of Missouri researcher Carl Gerhardt and his student Mitch Tucker have determined that the slight difference in the calls, here's the eastern again, and here's the copes, is how the females know which species males to buddy up with, the ones with the same chromosome number that they have. The work is in the proceedings of the Royal Society B, Biological Sciences. Speciation is often caused by a geographic barrier that keeps populations from mating, but the tree frog situation may be a rare case in which chromosome duplication and its subsequent effects presented a reproductive barrier. As in humans, it comes down to whether he calls. Want to know the route humans took when they first migrated from Africa into Europe? Seems that they might have marked the path. Not like Hansel and Gretel, who consciously left breadcrumbs. Ancient humans ate as they trekked, and they appear to have chucked aside the packaging for some of their slimy sustenance. Snails. Conventional wisdom has been that humans initially traveled from Africa to the Near East, then up around the Mediterranean through Lebanon before heading into Europe some forty to 50,000 years ago. But recently, some scientists have theorized that humans made it to Europe first and then headed east. Now there's more support for the old view that humans traveled through the Levant on the way to Europe in the form of the shells of edible marine snails. The study is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Researchers evaluated shells from an archaeological site dated to the Upper Paleolithic in Lebanon. The shells were mostly intact, except the tapered pointy tip had been removed, most likely for easier access to the meat inside. The scientists calculated the age of the shells via a variety of methods, and they found that the snails dated back almost 46,000 years. The earliest evidence of modern human remains in Europe seems to be no more than 45,000 years old. The snail evidence thus adds weight to the hypothesis that ancient people passed through the Levant on their way to Europe, and not at a snail's pace either. (laughs) 